den. Hello, my name is Camille Kraus. I work at the Department of Botany and Plant Physiology at the Czech University of Life Sciences and I'm a contracted scientific developer for the company EGT. The presentation today was created on request Jaroslav Mach to describe and demonstrate the work that we do in the university for EGT. During the first part of the presentation, I would like to introduce you to the general concept of stress and stress response, because in order to study stress at all and deal with how plants respond to stress caused by drought, frost or salinity, um, in this, it is the same at the end. Um, what type of stress it is, it is usually similar. We need to understand what stress is. For this occasion, I have prepared a concept according to Mr. Lewitt, who perceives stress, stress as a physical quantity. This means uh, that the more force or pressure we exert on the plant, the greater will be its response. According to this, we can observe the level of stress and quantify it as a zero which is a value when the plant is not stressed, it's in absolute physiological well-being, or as a slight load where the rope is stretched proportionally to the load created. Then there is the second level when we observe some more dramatic stress response because the stress is great, the rope is stretched and tense, and then there is value number three, when the stress is too high, the, level, the stress level for the plant is exceeded and it is usually lethal. Or sometimes the plant can even recover from it, but usually there is a significant reduction in the quality or a delay in the growth of the plant. Then there are three types of resistance to stress, either it is stress avoidance, uh, this is when the plant is resistant to stress. Uh, that is mainly due to the work with genetics. Then we have another situation in which we actually strengthen the rope to a level where the plant resists stress and is able to withstand these adverse conditions and then to regenerate and function normally. Then there is a stress-tolerant plant, which is the one growing there naturally for many for a long time, uh, and it is used to the stress, somehow survives it, and it's able to regenerate. Consequently, uh, when we understand what types of stress there are, then another variation is created. In this case, it is a stress model where we can see that not every stress has to have a negative effect, uh, but neither positive, and that uh, it gives us different combination. Based on this, we try to find active substances and treatments to benefit the plant and help it prosper. Then there are some basic problems. We know that in the beginning of stress exposure, uh, the first thing, the plant will stop cell growth. Uh, therefore, there are dramatic intensive changes that slow it down and reduce its speed and vitality. And in consequence, if this lasts long time, induce a lethal state when the plant is unable to grow further and dies. The question remains whether all these processes we observe are only a reaction to the momentary status and the plant has to acclimatize and we will help to withstand this difficult phase or whether it must adapt and we need to prepare its further population which is the seed uh, so it is able to of survival. We can divide the substances that we work with within the company into four basic categories. Either they are inorganic anions and cations. Um, we can also include these um, some saline solutions that we use as fertilizers, but we must aware that substances with fertilizing effect can also act uh, sometimes as stimulants, whether they are microelements or certain types of salts. Uh, 
Another important category are sugars and sugar alcohols. These can serve, serve as regenerating substances or as substances allowing fast release of energy for growth in times when the plant needs help. We can use these substances to accelerate the stress management response. Then we have non-protein amino acids, again substances that are very common, which include, for example, growth enhancement stimulants, auxins, gabarlins, and many other substances. Then there are organic acids, which are a very large category. They cover a lot of substances. We will not deal with them in this presentation, but they need to be mentioned. Of course, they are also present in the products of Energen. They can be humic, sub humic substances or some other plant extracts. And now to the scientific development. In the beginning, there has always to be a thesis based on which when we discover that a substance has some potential and is interesting, it has to go through the whole range of individual experiments. Uh, they start in the phytotron, and when these substances pass through the phytotron, they arrive to me at the university. Either they are tested in some specific loose cultures, which you can see here at the top right. In this case, it is a silica glass, uh, which is completely clean, does not affect the rune system, does not affect the plant, and I'm able to describe the sub substance exactly, uh, how it acts in a given plant, uh, either chemically or gasometrically. I measure physiological values such as photosynthesis, the amount of water evaporated from the leaf area, the amount of CO2, CO2 in the cell wall and many other values. During the testing process of an interesting new substance, we consult a lot of scientific literature. We try to apply the substance in the right concentration. If we don't know the concentration, we create concentration series. We use, uh, if we cannot deal with it directly in the greenhouse or in the academy or university, we use cooperation with companies that specialize in genetic research, such as Selgen, which tests uh, frost resistance. Uh, there is a picture of these experiments at the bottom right. You can see variations of three varieties of wheat uh, treated with a substance to increase frost resistance. These plants were then tested in large refrigerated boxes where they were frozen down to minus 25 degrees Celsius and then it was uh, determined whether the resistance was induced in those plants or whether the only difference was uh, brought by the variety. When we go through all these directed uh, tests in the laboratory where we can control the condition of the plant, the substrate and the surrounding climate. Then we move on to field experiments from which you can see a picture top left where uh, there were sown different varieties of wheat and then measured in combination of different treatments. And then again, we start measuring different values in the field whether it's the density of the vegetation, here are photos from the device SunScan that measures the amount of light that falls on the soil. Uh, so we know how much light is above the vegetation, how much below, and uh, from that we know the total leaf area. This quantity is very interesting, not only because it tells us how big is the total leaf area, therefore the assimilation, but also how much of the product falls on the soil and how much on the leaf, so we can also see the effective uh, area of the, of the plantation. Here you see more plant types like cereals, potatoes. Of course, we do not test only on these two plants. We try to work with the widest possible range of plant species. When we evaluate the results, we use different methods. One of them is the RFI measurement. The RFI is the so-called quantum yield. This value tells us how efficient is a plant in storing solar energy. In this graph, you see two lines. Uh, the axis of the untreated plant, this is the blue one. This shows us what would be natural course of energy storage in the plant system. 
The black uh, line, the axis, shows the amount of energy in the plant that was treated with Cleanstorm for hydric resistance. It is very important to know how to read this graph. We are not concerned with the amount of energy that runs upwards, the rate of rise, that which, which is the blue line, but the total area under the axis. That means the larger is this area, the more energy the plant stores. And we see here that the plant that is treated stores more energy than the one not treated. It will perform faster naturally and it will create a higher peak, but then subsequently when the photosynthetic apparatus is slowed down, which is a natural thing, it happens around one or two in the afternoon. After that, there is a sharp decline at the photosynthetic apparatus, a slowdown and stores energy at a lower level. In contrast, stimulated plants have a slower growth line, but they hold the photosynthetic level much longer. So the resulting quantum of stored energy in the plant that has been stimulated is much higher. And this at the end brings higher yield and better quality. And then when we need to analyze the substance that affected all these values. In this case, it was a substance that directly affects the reaction to stress. It is called proline. On the picture, you can see it as the red substance in the test tube. When we treated plants with clean storm, we measured an amazing value. There was a 300% increase of proline contact in the cell liquid in, uh, compared to the, to the control group. It is important to realize that this is compared to the control group because each type of plant, this value would be different. This substance is very interesting and important for several reasons. Firstly, if the plant can synth synthesize proline or if we force it to synthesize proline, uh, it starts acting as a memory substance for defense against extreme dryness. It means that if the proline was present in the past or if we applied it on the leaf, it is an information for the plant that this is what dryness feels like and it is. Uh, this is how I need to activate the defense against it. Subse subse subsequently, when the dryness goes away and the plant gets water, the proline molecule breaks down and a large amount of energy-rich substances are released, which then the plant can use to repair the, uh, the dryness damage. Uh, the plant repairs the damage, it regenerates, and it's able to catch up the time loss compared to the control group. If the proline is present in a given plant organism, it, it has an anti-stress effect. How does it work? Proline thickens the cellular content, thus increasing the ability of the plants to extract water from the soil profile. The higher is the content of proline, the greater is the ability of the plant to extract uh, water from the soil profile. So to sum it up, there is a substance that gives the plant the information about how to recognize dryness and how to defend, defend itself against it. At the same time, it helps to regenerate the plant and its present, uh, presence in the plant creates a direct anti-stress effect. This means that it increases the the ability to extract uh, water from the soil profile and also the management of water regime within the plant, but this, we will talk about it later. I would like to talk about the reaction of the plants where we applied clean storm. In these plants, there was induced an increase of 300% uh, um, of proline. You can see it in the set of tubes on the right, colored in red. On the left, we see white test tubes with the same analyte, but there is no proline, so there is no color. Uh, there was an interesting thing. Plants that were not treated with clean storm didn't have proline in them, but physiologically, if I evaluated them only visually, I would say that they are already suffering from drought, from dryness. There was wilting of the leaves, reduction of water content, reduction of photosynthesis. On the contrary, plants that were treated with clean storm, uh, 
which we extracted the red tubes, uh, they were visually not stressed, they were fully tungsten leaves, the photosynthesis was working, the fluorescence too, all the values that we measured, but chemically those plants that apparently weren't dry, dry yet, uh, inside they were already sensing dryness in contrast to the controlled plants which were optically wilting, but, so I would say that they are already suffering from uh, dryness but inside chemically their metabolism has not yet built any defenses. And it was very interesting for us to confirm this phenomenon that we are able to provide the information to the plant to defend itself against stress before it actually occurs. Um, this is the way to display the content or increase of the osmotic potential. Um, the osmotic potential is the ability to extract water from the soil profile. It is visualized in reverse, so the graph looks like it hangs upside down. Uh, the higher the negative number in the absolute value there is, the higher the force with which the plant absorbs water. You could say that there is a negative pressure created. Here are some columns. The blue columns are control plants, uh, which were in moisture well-being all the time. Then there are orange columns. These are plants that were stressed by by dryness, but they were not treated by the biostimulant. And then there are green columns, there are plants that were again exposed to hydric stress, but they were treated by a biostimulant, in this case it was again clean storm. The interesting thing here was that if we treat the plant, we see that the stimulated plant is able to create a greater, greater osmotic potential. It means it draws water from the soil profile with bigger force uh, compared to the untreated plant. Of course, when a plant gets dry, it always increases its osmotic potential because uh, at the end there will always be a certain content of proline, but it won't be higher than in the plant that was prepared for the stress. Uh, and in the fourth sample, this is after rehydration, the result is very interesting. The plants that were stimulated uh, retained a higher osmotic potential, which means that the plant was no longer under hydric stress it retains a higher osmotic potential. Uh, this is that if there is another drought, the plant will immediately take in water with greater force, it will pull water from the soil profile and it will resist the drought for longer than a plant that was not treated, which won't have strength to do it, it won't have enough negative pressure. For a plant to have, uh, if a plant ha to have water in its tissue, it's not only that the plant should intake the water, but it must also manage it, which is very important because if the plant is stressed and it absorbs water, that is the red graph, in the beginning it will evaporate water very inefficiently. To cool, it is to cool the leaf area. On the contrary, if the plant is treated with biostimulant, that's the blue line, it closes its pores and starts saving water because it is better for the plant physiologically to have moist tissues that retain water and the plant is still able to do photosynthesis and to synthesize substances which will help her cope with that stress. When you look at the red graph, you will see that the plant is stressed, it starts to evaporate, then the water runs out and there is a sharp drop in the evaporation from the leaf area, but not because it closed the vents, it is because there is no uh, longer the water there. In contrast, the plant that was treated maintains a photosynthetic and transpiration co coefficient, which is lower and slowly decreases, so photosynthesis decreases, but then subsequently when the water comes, it returns to the standard in which uses water very efficiently and copes with the stress much better. This information is confirmed by the other part of the graph where we have changes in the rate of transpiration. Important is the first days of stress. In the graph it is named actually as the eighth day because we induced the hydric stress on the eighth day and that was when we started measuring.
You can see a sample stimulated with CleanStorm and a sample without treatment. Both columns represent plants that have been affected by hydric stress. In the first phase, the plants that saved water are still cooling here, then the vents got closed and those plants save water as long as they can. Probably, and this is how we interpret it, uh, the purple column doesn't represent uh, saving of water, but simply there was no more water. After rehydration, there is an enormous increase in the treated plant. This is the red bar. In the evaporation of water from the leaf, which means that the plant was not dry, but it saved and stored the water, and then when it started absorbing water into the roots again, it could start evaporating it efficiently. In contrast, a variant that was stressed without stimulation has extensive damage, meaning dried root tips, disrupted vascular joints, and it does not have the apparatus that would be able to conduct water from the root system into the leaf area, effectively evaporate and therefore regenerate. On the day 42, this is another sample after 10 days to find out if the tendency is repeating or changing so that we have control that the theory that we are trying to confirm here is true. Um, these graphs always need to be shown together. Very often it happens to companies or to scientists that they show either the E, that is transpiration, or A, which is photosynthesis, separately. These two events are linked together. It is impossible to describe transpiration without photosynthesis and photosynthesis without transpiration because one doesn't work without the other. I would like to mention here the third sample, the sixth and the eighth. In the third sample, which was very interesting, we applied CleanStorm on plants of corn. We can monitor here the development and response of the plant to stress caused by lack of water. Most of the plants that were stressed and not stimulated, as we said in the previous graphs, had enormous increase of transpiration. In this case, it is the green bar in the third sample. Uh, there's a tremendous evaporation of water. Of course, due to that, you will also increase the intensity of photosynthesis. But this will be very inefficient because the plant evaporates something that we'll need later. In contrast, when you look at the pink column, it is a stressed plant uh, which was treated. We introduced into the plant the information that this is how the hydric stress, stress feels like and that it should resist it. So there won't be an extreme increase of evaporation uh, there will be some, but it's not so high that it will be a problem for the plant. When we looked at, at the six sample, this is the course. This is. Um, uh, this is uh, the course of the process. In the control group, the blue bar, we see stable photosynthesis. Then there is the green column, uh, where we still observe inefficient evaporation of water. So the plant does not save water, it is running out of energy, the synthesis is not right because there is not enough water, vents will be open and the leaf area will decrease. In contrast, in contrast, the treated plant is already reduced to a relatively low photosynthetic level and it runs on economy. It survives a bad period in some vegetative rest, uh, waiting for water. Then comes water, this is the eighth sample, where you can see that the variant that has been all this time in the vegetative phase, this is the pink bar, the stress with simulation, there will be an increase in photosynthesis and transpiration over the original variant, which when evaluated before, synthesized much more than the control group and the stressed variant. But, but as a consequence of that stimulation, it exceeds the stressed variant without stimulation, and it is at the same level as the control group. Another interesting conclusion from this experiment was that plants that were in moisture well-being all the time, which is the orange column, had 
as a result of stimulation, higher photosynthetic activity and transpiration than the control group. It means that stimulation is not suitable only for plants under stress, but also for all plants where we can help the plants to perform better and as a result to have better yield and quality. Another aspect of our cooperation is the production of customized substances for the client. Here we, we tested different uh, variation of treatment for seeds of poppy plants for the company Labris. We tested them according to the ISTA methodology. Uh, here we came across a relatively big problem because this method is designed to control the toxicity of given substance. According to the methodology, we let the seed germinate in distilled water. Uh, those are the 100 value columns on the far left. And then we measure the root length in the different mordants or substances intended to cause toxicity or stimulation. During the testing, we thought it's all not working because when you look at it, all root sprouts were shorter compared to the control group, so the stimulation rather delayed the root instead of stimulating it. Then we realized that the length of the root might not be directly authoritative and that we should look deeper. Then we took uh, the test plants and put them under magnifying binocular, and this way we could check what's going on inside the plant. You can observe that the picture on the left is the untreated plant, uh, germinated only in distilled water, and on the right there is a plant that was treated with a given substance. It is quite interesting that according to the methodology, we should be only looking at the len length of the root germ, which in this case is thin, undeveloped, but relatively long. On the right, there is a treated plant where the development was delayed, but the germination energy was not directed to the growth of the root lengthwise, but to increasing its strength in the effective area, which helps the root receive nutrients and water. Furthermore, if you look at the picture on the right, you can see that in the upper part, uh, where the green part connects to the root, we can observe already differentiated vascular joint and a, and a part of the aerial section of the poppy, uh, which indicates that the plant is not only further in the development of the root system, but also physiologically compared to the control plant. We found out that we have to modify the methodologies that are prepared for the sterile conditions of a science laboratory, uh, but if we want to move the science into practice, we need to adjust the methodology to suit our needs and look at the results from a different angle. Thank you and hope to see you again.